an injury scare at Tuesday's practice. We've got the details. It's locked on LSU. Let's go. You are locked on LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, let's get it. It is Locked On LSU, your team every day. I'm your host, Matt Moscona. Glad to have you aboard with us here. We are free, available wherever you get podcasts. So thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We are brought to you today by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Um, who could be the next Tiger, future Tiger, to commit? Our visit with Shay Dixon. A couple of tidbits there. An injury scare at fall camp on Tuesday that we've got to delve into, and a starter returns from injury. We'll get to that here in a bit. But only appropriate that we start today's episode with a fall camp report. And uh, Tigers are back on the practice field on Tuesday. And uh, this was the 10th practice of fall camp and the eighth of which we had media availability. So we're getting to the point now where we, the media who are in attendance, have gotten to see a lot of this team. You know, on average, they're working out for about two hours. They start indoors, they come outdoors. And as Brian Kelly said last week, they're sort of climatizing his word outdoor. So they're they're decreasing the amount of time indoor and increasing the amount of time outdoors every day. So, you know, today it was yeah, about an hour and 15 minutes uh, that they were outside, maybe, maybe close to an hour and a half that they were outside. And um my the the thesis I shared with you yesterday, if you weren't here on the previous episode, but highly go, highly recommend you go check it out. Was that LSU defensively, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Meaning, when we watch this team in individual drills, cornerbacks against receivers, one on one, LSU's receivers win darn near every rep. Pass rush drills, the defensive line is getting manhandled mostly by the offensive line. But when they come together in team periods, we see this defense come together, play fast, physical. They increase pressure on Nussmeyer. They force him off his spot. You can double team on the secondary. You can get your help with with safeties. And the level of difficulty on the offense increases, and they're not having nearly as much success, which I think is really encouraging. Well, we go out there on Tuesday, and the first thing I watch is that wide receiver cornerback drill. And they played it around the goal lines. They went from the 12-yard line to the 10-yard line to the 5-yard line. And it was either two or three receiver sets. As a matter of fact, I posted a lot of videos uh, from this period. And while this was overwhelming on Monday in favor of the offense, I told you at one point the offense won seven straight and nine of ten, and the only miss was was a misfire by Colin Hurley. Well, this was a dramatically different scene. Kyron Lacey won the first rep. The defense won the next seven. In total, the offense won nine. The defense won 10. The defense actually won the day in the individual period against the offense. There were two bad coverage busts. Uh, Shelton Sampson scored on um, on Ashton Stamps. Stamps would just lost his man in the coverage. And then... Um, Javen Nicholas scored on Bernard Causey. Of course, Bernard Causey's a, a freshman, and he lost his, his spot, and Nicholas was wide open. Other than that, it was mostly the D. Uh, Kamorian Pimpton had a beautiful touchdown reception back pylon. Uh, Aaron Anderson coming across the formation, but the middle of the end zone, on the side, on the sideline, but about midway up the, the end zone on the sideline, uh, dragged his feet. Beautiful touchdown reception there as well. There's actually video, of both those on my Twitter, if you care to check it out, at Matt Moscona, my ex. It's right there on the screen if you're watching. So it was really encouraging that the D actually covered and played well. Um, we did get to see two different 11-on-11 11 11 periods. And again, this is where we've typically seen the defense rise up and play very well. The first 11-on-11 period, there's a little bit of an asterisk here. So it was situational, and they kept playing first down. So here's how they set it up. Offense starts at the 20-yard line, their own 20, so 80 yards of field in front of them. And they'd run a play, and regardless of that play, what happened, they'd spot the ball, and it would be first down again. 
And so they were moving with, with tempo. There was no tackling or thud. It was more just like two-hand touch. So, yes, there were 11 guys on the field, but it wasn't exactly like a scrimmage. And the, the offense moved the ball. And maybe the coolest part of this was when they got near the goal line. One of the formations we saw was Aaron Anderson going in motion, like a jet sweep motion, which we saw Malik Neighbors do a lot a year ago. Well, it was Aaron Anderson who went in motion, and then they ran a counter to John Emery around left end, and he scored. It was really encouraging to see. It was a really cool play design also, and to see those different guys get involved. But again, there was no tackling. It was just touch, and, and there wasn't any opportunity really for the defense to get a stop. Now, that changed in the last period that the media got to see for the day. Uh, this was a, a situational period. It was 11 on 11, and it was thud. The offense started at their own 40-yard line, so 60 yards of field in front of them. And this was an end-of-half or end-of-game scenario where they had to go quickly. And the defense allowed one first down. Nussmeyer was pressured, rolled to his left, scrambled for eight yards, which is actually good to see. There's all this question about Ken Garrett Nussmeyer run. Well, it was pressured. The, the pocket was collapsing. He escaped, rolled left, and ran for eight yards, got out of bounds to stop the clock, which brought up a third down with the clock stopped. And the offense, with just about five seconds to go, elected to kick a 55-yard field goal. Uh, the defense iced the kicker, Damian Ramos. They had a timeout. They called it. Uh, I should mention also that the offense did have a five-yard false start uh, on the on the drive as well. Prior was the second play. They got a, f- a five yards on first down, false start, so it ended up being second and, and ten. Um, but after that, it, the Damian Ramos, I'll, I won't spoil the ending. He he boomed it. Uh, it was plenty of leg. He missed it wide left though. So the defense got to stop. They forced a fifty-five-yard field goal attempt, which was missed wide left. But the other interesting thing, you know. Um, Whit Weeks met with the media after practice, and he was talking about how Blake Baker has just brought all this infectious energy to the defense, and it's so evident. In that situation where Damian Ramos was going out to attempt the 55-yarder, keep in mind, this isn't a packed stadium. It's just the team on the field. The offense is on one sideline. The defense is on the other. And the defense was trying to make noise to distract Ramos. So you got, I don't know, 40, 50 guys on the sideline yelling and clapping their hands and trying to make it, trying to distract him. Like, that... Nothing even close to that happened a year ago. We didn't see anything close to that. So the the engagement, the intensity, the the joy for the defense seems to be out there. I I know every time I talk about this, y'all, um there, there's got it. I know there's the segment of the fan base thinking one of two extremes. One, oh, Scone said they're gonna be awesome. I'm not saying that. And the other is, oh, Scone's such a homer. I'm not saying they're great. And y'all know I ain't no homer. But what I am saying is Blake Baker has simplified the defense, allowing them to play fast and free and physical and and not think as much. And so you're not seeing coverage busts. And now he's starting to build other packages on top of that. Some really interesting pass rush packages as well. And the more they keep building, the more confidence they get, I think the better they're going to play. And yes, the energy... Uh, is different defensively at practice. They they genuinely, I mean, look, it's it's hot and nobody's having a great time when it's hot in practice and it sucks, but they enjoy each other. They're playing physical. I should note one other uh, thing that did happen. Uh, J.K. Johnson and Kylan Billiot scuffled. Um, uh, J.K. Johnson ripped Billiot's helmet off and they, they, they scuffled on the sideline during the 11-on-11 period. So you're at that point in camp where sometimes skirmishes may happen. Also, after the first team missed a field goal in their drive, the second team put a drive together, and they did move the ball. And I should say, the circumstance was different for the second team. They didn't start at their own 40. They started in in, at, in a goal line scenario, and they were just working third and four, third or fourth in goal. So it was third and goal. If you didn't score, you went for it on fourth. And we saw the play of the day. Uh, A.J. Swan, who ran with the twos in this drill, A.J. Swan was being pressured, and he just heaved one toward the back line of the end zone 
and Xavion Thomas elevated out of a group of people and, and hauled in a one-handed touchdown catch, falling out of bounds and got his foot down. The defense initially was, was waving like, no, he didn't get it, but the, the referees ruled that he did catch it and it was a touchdown. So play of the day went to Xavion Thomas, which only continues to underscore the embarrassment of riches this team has, the talent this team has at wide receiver. Man, they are... <laughs> They are so deep and talented at receiver that there is just no shortage of options there, which is actually a pretty good segue into the next topic. Unless you got an injury scare at practice, and it got me thinking, who are the most irreplaceable players on this team? I want to talk about that next. It's Locked on LSU, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Y'all know I've told you so many times how much I love going to Major League Baseball games. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, quite honestly. Um, I've gotten to see so many ballparks. Went to the World Series in 01 with my dad at Yankee Stadium post 9-11. Of course, been to plenty of games, both at the Astrodome and at Minute Maid. Been out to San Francisco and got to see that beautiful ballpark. I- I've been very fortunate. Wrigley, um, the, the, the Chicago White Sox Stadium. I don't even know what they call it now, but this was like in 1999 when I went out there. But anyway. I love going to, to ball games, and anytime I have an opportunity to go to a big league park, been to Cleveland, uh, old Jacobs Field. I don't even know what they call it now, but I love going to ball games. And game time makes that so easy. It's actually the best way to buy MLB tickets. Um, last minute deals—you can save up to sixty percent buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, all that stuff. They have flash deals where you can save even more with exclusive, exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. You know it really takes a lot of the guesswork out of buying tickets. It gives you total peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat on your phone before you buy. They have all in cost, all in pricing, so you know the total cost up front. You could buy your tickets in seconds, which is two taps on on the app on your phone. There's just so many ways to save money on tickets no matter when you buy. Like the last minute deals go right up to the start of the event, even an hour after it starts. If if you buy tickets, especially to Major League Baseball or any event, and you haven't tried game time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem with the code Locked On College. That's L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Download game time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed, it's game time. LSU had an injury scare at practice that I want to talk about here in just a quick second. Of course, we appreciate you for making us here at Locked on LSU, your first listen every day. How about making your second listen Locked on College Football? Uh, Spencer McLaughlin and I actually texted earlier today. I'm going to go on a show and give my uh, LSU season uh, prediction coming up here uh, in the coming days. But it's a great time to find Locked on College Football. It's available on YouTube, wherever you get podcasts, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. When LSU went into individual periods, we got to see the offensive line and defensive line doing uh, run blocking drills. And at one point, uh, senior defensive lineman Jacoby and Guillory came off the field and was favoring his left knee. Um, he was obviously in a lot of pain. Trainers brought him over uh, to the training table. They took his brace off. I was standing there, kind of just watching them. And they were kind of feeling his knee and checking it for stability. Um, they got him back up. They put his knee brace back on. He didn't return to practice, at least not when we saw. Uh, he did finish the rest of the day on the, the stationary bike on the sideline. And make no mistake, uh, Jacoby and Guillory is LSU's best, most experienced interior defensive lineman. And that is a position where they could ill afford to lose anybody. When Guillory exited, Jalen Lee took Guillory's place. As we saw Saturday, Gio Paez was absent, and uh, Jalen Lee took Paez's place. So I think it's pretty safe to say right now that Guillory, Paez, Lee would be your first three. And then either Sean Washington, Kimo Macaneoli would, would be next there. And then you've got some other bodies behind them. JVR Suggs, the transfer from Grand Valley State. I think Dominic McKinley, the, the five-star freshman, could certainly play a, a role as far as ro- a, a rotational piece on that defensive front. But I started thinking, who are the most irreplaceable players on this team? I mean, Garrett Nussmeyer is the answer. I mean, he's your, he's your fourth-year uh, quarterback. And after Garrett Nussmeyer, you've got a redshirt freshman in Ricky Collins and A.J. Swan who transferred in from Vanderbilt. 
And Swan is a, um, I, I'll I'll use this phrase, and I don't like to use it, but you'll understand when I say it. He's a check down Charlie. Swan doesn't have a great a great arm, um, and I I don't think he has great mobility either. But he can be accurate in the short and intermediate game, and I think that's that's probably where he's best. I think Ricky Collins has the higher ceiling, but I think accuracy and just functionality within a new offense is something that has to come as he continues to develop. So the surest way for LSU season to, to go off the rails is an, an injury to Garrett Nussmeyer. Look, you're, the best player on the team is Will Campbell. But, you know, God forbid, knock on wood, if anything were to happen that would take Will Campbell away from the field, you could flip Emory Jones over to left tackle. And I'm not saying you wouldn't miss a beat, but he's a more than capable left tackle. I mean, Emory Jones was a left tackle in, in high school. He could certainly play left tackle at this level. May project as a guard in the NFL. We'll see. But Emory Jones could very easily flip over and play left tackle at LSU and be the best left tackle behind Will Campbell on this team. And then you could have either you know Tyree Adams, Weston Davis, Bo Bortle on anybody play right tackle in, in Emory Jones' spot. So it's not ideal, but, but you could have a really good left tackle um, if something happened to, to Will. You know, I, I'd probably say the two guys on the team that are irreplaceable are Mason Taylor and Jacoby and Guillory. You know, Mason Taylor, really because with, you know, with Mac Markway leaving, the two scholarship tight ends you have after Mason Taylor are Camorian Pimpton and Trey Des Green. And while Pimpton has, has grown physically and, and got better in the, the run blocking part, he, he's a pass catching tight end. He, he's not a, an every down or a blocking tight end. And certainly the same is true for Trey Des Green. Um, so you really don't have a great all around tight end option after Mason Taylor and Jacoby and Guillory is so obviously your best interior defensive line uh, lineman at a position where you have a giant question mark. You've, you've got a lot of bodies and you've got a lot of veteran bodies. Guillory's a fifth year guy. Paez is a sixth year guy. Jalen Lee's a fifth year guy. You know, Kimo Macanaoli is a fourth year guy, although he's just moving over to the defensive side of the ball. You know, Sean Washington's a third year guy. You got veteran guys, you got veteran guys, big guys. You just don't have a lot of skins on the wall. And of all of them, Guillory is definitively your best. That's a spot where you can ill afford to lose anybody, let alone your best player. So we'll we'll see what happens here with Jacoby and Guillory. Media does have availability on on Wednesday. They practice Thursday, Friday, although no media availability. Then we're back out there on Saturday. So we'll watch this with Jacobian, but the prudent thing to do for LSU is say, Hey tank, uh, go put some ice on that thing. Get, get in the recovery room and just take a few, take a few days off and make sure you're ready to go two weeks from Saturday when LSU is playing USC out in Las Vegas. So a little bit of a scare there with Jacoby and Guillory, but hopefully all is well should mention Jelani Watkins uh, in that, um, wide receiver cornerback drill got tangled a little bit, was a little gimpy on his right ankle. Um, and then one maybe positive note, uh, as I mentioned, a, a starter potentially returning from injury. Uh, we saw Nathan Dybert on the field. I threw you, a loop, threw you for a loop there, didn't I? Um, Nathan Dybert, for the last two years, has been LSU's kickoff specialist. And in the regular season finale against Texas A&M, Dybert tore his right ACL, the ACL in his kicking leg. He tore his ACL making a tackle. And up until this point in fall camp, we have not seen Nathan Dybert. Well, he was out there in uniform with the kickers on Tuesday. Uh, he was not kicking, at least not that I saw. Um, during the periods I was watching the kickers, I did not see Dybert kick. But that's so it's not to say he didn't. I just didn't see him kick. But it was nice to see him out there. And in the meantime, uh, Damian Ramos has been handling kickoff duties. So if you can get Nathan Dybert back, that's a boost to your special teams, which, as we know, the last two years, special teams have been rough. Jay Bramlett has been consistent, but you continue to struggle. Um, Peyton Todd dropped a, a snap on punt team on Tuesday. Um, you know Blake Oxendorf, the Louisiana Tech transfer, he boomed a 60-yarder. In the very next punt, he had an end-over-end knuckleball that went about 30 yards. Aaron Anderson muffed it, by the way. Um, so special teams continues to be a little, a bit of a challenge. But getting Nathan Dybert back would be a, a shot in the arm if you can get him. So just something to file away and think about. All right. Um, it is locked on LSU, and we're glad to have you aboard with us. You know, the, the 2024 season is about to start, but... 
recruiting never stops. So you never really stop thinking about 2025. And every week I have a chance to visit with my buddy Shay Dixon from On3, the Bengal Tiger. And we talked about, uh, about Jalen Battle, the commit that, um, uh, that LSU got on, uh, on Monday, the defensive line commit that LSU got. Excuse me, Dylan Battle, Dylan Battle, that LSU got on Monday. And I asked Shay, um, who could be next, including two prospects set to announce coming this Saturday. You'll hear what Shay Dixon had to say next. Locked on LSU, your team every day. So LSU's up to 22 commitments for the class of 2025 after Dylan Battle, defensive tackle out of Texas, picked LSU on Monday. Good timing to visit with my buddy Shay Dixon from On3, the Bengal Tiger, as I get to do uh, every Tuesday. And after Battle's commitment, there's two more LSU prospects who are going to make their announcement on Saturday. Uh, Bryce Fitzgerald is a defensive back who LSU's gotten in on. And then also... um, Mike Tyler, who is a uh, a tight end out of South Carolina that LSU seems to be leading for. So I asked Shay about those two uh, prospects whose announcements are coming up. And then we talked about another prospect that could be ready to pop for LSU soon. Yeah, they'll announce on the same day. I think that Fitzgerald is probably going to end up at FSU. That's the in-state team. I've heard that being close to his mom is uh, a big thing for him. So FSU locking down the state of Florida with a the guy they've been after for a while is no surprise. I think the surprise was LSU kind of turned up the heat and jumped Miami and Florida uh, mm-hmm. and are in the top two there. So we'll keep an eye on that one, see if anything changes before the weekend uh, for the DB out of Florida. But uh, I would keep a close eye on Mike Tyler. Uh, we know that the first-year tight ends coach, Slade Nagel, uh, has wanted to add a second tight end. They got J.D. LaFleur committed last summer. He's a on 300 player, he's a four star. And then they brought Mike Tyler in from the state of South Carolina. He lives in Columbia, uh, where USC is. And uh, he's got an offer from the Gamecocks, but they LSU offered him a camp. And then they brought him for an official. And then he was back for the Bayou Splash in July. And now he's ready to announce. And in that time, South Carolina has begun to offer other tight ends. So I think the writing's on the wall here that uh, LSU's inching closer to, to adding another tight end, which would be two for the class. And probably be it for the position of the cycle. Jay, I probably went out of order here because we were talking about defensive tackle, and you mentioned that this would be a four, maybe five class defensive tackle. Um, I know Walter Mathis is another guy the Tigers are in on. What's the latest there? Yeah, he's told us uh, Chad Simmons had on three, caught up with him this week, and he said kind of keep an eye on the end of the month. So um, before September 1st, I think that we'll uh, see Buddy Mathis, Walter Mathis, come off the board, and he's a Georgia product, a defensive tackle that Bo Davis and Blake Baker uh, have been really high on for a while. So um, he's kind of got the who's who of offers. I mean, Clemson hosted him for an official, Auburn, LSU. uh, Others have been in the mix with offers, but I think that the pitch Bo Davis has and the need for playing time and kind of the fit he felt uh, when he visited Baton Rouge all lined up for him. So he doesn't say a whole lot, doesn't do a ton of interviews, but uh, he did tell Chad to keep an eye on things at the end of the month, and uh, both Chad uh, and myself have our picks in on the on three RPM for LSU. So if they get him, that would be four D tackles, which is a great place to be in, given it's a need position and senior seasons haven't even started. The- so uh, expect the Tigers to go uh, one for two on Saturday and perhaps pop a defensive tackle and Buddy Mathis coming up. I did also ask Shea because a week from Saturday, the 24th, is when Jonah Williams, the number one safety in the country, is set to make his college announcement. And the convos I've had with Shea is that it seems like this is a kid from Galveston, a uh, ball high school would be down to LSU and Texas A&M. And Shea kind of corrected me that there might be another school in the mix. You know, I think you've got to put Texas in that conversation just okay. because he visited them uh, right before the dead period kind of ended. It was a one week open period. And that was the lone school he visited. And a big part of that obviously is Texas got involved when the baseball staff got there. So We'll see how much shakeup happens there with his recruitment. I have always thought it was going to come down to LSU and A&M just because he's a Galveston kid. He plays football and baseball. But uh, look, between NIL discussions and the reality that he is one of the most courted guys out there being uncommitted as a five-star and number one safety. Uh, and look, baseball prospect, we can figure out 
uh, down the road where he fits into a college. But football-wise, I've had people tell me this is a Jamal Adams type player. So a uh, very serious uh, football future if he embraces it. And LSU wants him badly. Uh, I will say there have been no new picks made on the Ontario RPM this month. So uh, Jonah is keeping it quiet. I think a lot of people are waiting to see as we get closer to August 24th kind of what starts to leak out in terms of teams in the lead or or who might be able to pull it off. But I do think this is one of those that um, kind of goes down into those final days of discussions with teams. And uh, he might be leaning one way or think he knows something, but uh, enough teams in this mix feel like, hey, we're talking to him every day. We feel good about it. Uh, and LSU is one of them. So this will be an exciting one to keep track of. The Tigers are absolutely in it. For what it's worth, Shea also mentioned three names that LSU continuing to recruit guys that are currently committed elsewhere that could be flip candidates. Jordan Crawford, Cade Phillips, and C.J. Wiley. C.J. Wiley, of course, the legacy Chuck Wiley's son. Chuck Wiley was a great defensive lineman for LSU in the 90s. C.J. Wiley from Georgia committed to Florida State, uh, the great wide receiver. And LSU might still have a a foot in the door there, so we'll keep you posted. Recruiting, uh, never done, never boring, so we appreciate Shea for the visits here uh, weekly. Okay, that's going to do it for us here on Locked on LSU, and thanks for making Locked on LSU your first listen. Now go check out Locked on College Football from NIL deals to the never-ending conference realignment rumors. Spencer McLaughlin gets you ready for an exciting season on the gridiron. You can find the link to Locked on College Football in the description so you don't need to go search for it. It's part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, that'll do it for us here. Uh, If you're new, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Rate us, leave a review. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, smash that like button, hit the bell so you're notified whenever we post a new video. And be sure to let a friend know that they love the Tigers. We got you here every single day for Locked on LSU, your team. Every day.